Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Health Report, a production of St. Boniface Hospital Foundation with your host, Greg Mackling and Chris Gutierrez. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chris. How's your week been? It's been fabulous. How about yours, Greg? Well, other than waking up to uh, living in winter wonderland yesterday yeah. morning, it's been It was kind of pretty, though. I was like, it oh, was round pretty. two, Christmas. Absolutely. And by the time the afternoon rolled around, it was just really white, heavy rain, really, exactly. is all it was. Uh, this morning, we are going to uh, give you a behind-the-scenes look at uh, life-changing healthcare and groundbreaking research, which takes place on the campus at St. Boniface Hospital, and some huge news on the groundbreaking research front from Dr. Grant Pierce, who will join us later on in the program. You'll have to stick around to find out what world shake, really world shaking announcement was made out of uh, Albrechtson Research Center this past week. It was, uh, I didn't even know Dr. Pierce was working on this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but I kind of knew it was coming. But um, it's really exciting and it kind of ties into our show today, I think, when we talk about the future and the generations to come. So uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about it for those that haven't heard about it yet. Now, Brett McGarry always calls me the king of segues. Okay. I think you just might have become the princess or queen of segues with that. So I'll take that title. Out- outstanding, Chris. This morning, we will be focusing our attention on how you can leave a legacy as part of your estate planning and joining us in studio this Sunday morning, I think this is the third, consecutive, fourth consecutive leave legacy <laughs> month that uh, Carolyn Kiva has joined us. She's a lawyer, associate counsel, Thompson, Dorfman, Sweatman, LLP, and a board member at St. Boniface Hospital Foundation. And this year you're in studio. Last year you were on the phone with us from Toronto. So I'm good, here. Good to see you, Carolyn. So happy to be back in friendly Manitoba. Oh, it's good Truly to have you friendly home. friendly Manitoba. It's good to have you yeah, home. Yeah, we're glad Thank to have you. you back. So let's start with leaving a legacy. What? What does this mean as it pertains to giving, maybe in a philosophical and an overall sense in your mind, Caroline? You know, I think it means how do you want to be remembered? And whether that's uh, um, among family members or with uh, various charitable organizations, how do you want to be remembered? So sit down and you have that discussion with uh, individuals and uh, they tell us about, you know, tell us, the royal us, (laughs) lawyers who practice in the area of estate planning, you know, what's important to them. And we try to capture that in their, in their long-term goals and wishes. You probably have those discussions fairly often at the foundation, Chris, because a lot of those legacy conversations come from some sort of life or life changing experience. And in our case, that happens either at the hospital or through research or, you know, friend of a friend or a family member who's been positively affected by the care uh, that they've received at St. Boniface Hospital. Fair to say? Absolutely, Greg. I mean, it's so many times that it's something that happens or it's um, often near death experiences that make people think, okay, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to leave this legacy? And and also it's just longtime donors who want to leave their last gift. They want to put their, their very last gift in their will and make sure that um, they're honored forever and ever. And you know, so we, we have a lot of people that come and talk to us about it, but Caroline, I'm wondering, um, what are the conversations like with you? When you, when you talk to your clients, do they, are they, are they opening the conversation saying, I want to give to charity? Or is that something that you do and talk to them about the importance of leaving a gift in the room I to a charity? A of, yeah, it's a bit of both. Um, for those who are really uh, charitable minded, they'll bring it up. But I make it a point of always asking about charity because I think, uh, you know, sometimes we're intimidated when we hear about these large gifts being given in town or in the world. And uh, we think, well, how is my little gift going to make a difference? But it does make a a difference. And uh, so I at least want to make sure that I have that conversation with them if they don't bring it up first. And that's a good point because it really does make a difference. And I think you're absolutely right. We have a lot of donors that come to us and say, well, you know, I, I can't name a, a part of the hospital. I can't, you know, I'm not going to leave you millions of dollars. But um, it's just like anybody that gives a donation to us. It's really, truly every dollar counts. And we have um, gifts in the will that come in that are $500, $1,000, um, all the way up to, you know, $2 million. And every single one of those donations gets put to use on like right when we get in. It's just incredible. Obviously, there are tax benefits for the giver and for the uh, for the uh, estate of the giver in this case, if if you've passed on. But also in terms of uh, of an investment, when you hear how some of the money that goes into general revenue at the foundation, in particular, that gets given and invested in research, where you can see a hundred thousand dollar investment in a certain type of re- research turn into a million dollars in other sort of grants and, and research money, the way your money can grow 
by leaving that legacy sometimes I think is underappreciated. I think so too. And I think that people, and Carolyn, you might be able to talk about this, but I think people don't realize how big of an impact they can have through their will because it's not just a set amount, right? There, there's different ways that people can leave a gift in their will to a charity. Is that correct? Oh yeah, this is the fun part. So <laughs> I get to talk about leaving a, a you know a set amount or a residue gift. So you know or a percentage. We can talk about designating a beneficiary on RSPs or registered assets in general, t- tax free savings accounts. We can talk about gifting uh, existing life insurance policies or getting a life insurance policy and leaving it to a charity. So there are a multitude of ways, setting up an endowment fund, like you could just give the money and let the charity figure out what it's going to do with it. Sometimes it's as important to give a gift that's used to keep the lights on and the doors open um, as it is to, you know, fund research or, you know, purchase a particular piece of equipment, a greatest gift, a greatest need. That's a great point. And, you know, we are seeing that a lot, too, when you, you mentioned about the life insurance policy. And, and a few of our donors have said, you know, over the years, we bought multiple life insurance policies. And we did that for our children and we did this for so on. And now they're realizing they, they don't need them and they didn't really realize that they could gift those. So that's interesting to see people do that because that's that can be a significant gift um, in itself. So are you seeing more of that or is that just what I'm seeing a little bit more of that? Well, I talk about it all the time, so... Uh, so maybe that's why I'm seeing yeah, more of it. Well, I, I enjoy talking about uh, life insurance. I think it has a, a great purpose, and it's sort of piecemeal. You know, it's a separate and apart from what you might leave your own family, so it is a really nifty way of giving and potentially giving a larger amount. So whether you do have that existing policy and you can uh, transfer the ownership of the policy and get a tax credit for the premiums paid and cash surrender value, oftentimes it's used with whole, off, whole life policies, or you go out and you get a policy, but wow, can you make a difference with a life insurance gift? Okay, so you used a few terminologies there. Whole life, mm-hmm. cash surrender value, and then there was one other piece of terminology that uh, I should have written down when you said it. But what this is, is what is like a tax exam? No, no exam. <laughs> Don't go there. No exam. Just this whole idea of a whole life policy and cash surrender value. What what, what does that mean? Can you elaborate I mean, as, a little as, bit? If, it's pretty technical. I'm sure it's you could technical, elaborate yeah. extensively, it's pretty technical, but in a general and I don't want to put, sense. Uh, dry, uh, to uh, put uh, listeners to sleep so much. But I really think that. Um, if you've got some existing policies, right. you know, I think picking up the phone and calling your charity, um, in this case, mm-hmm. St. Boniface Hospital Foundation, mm-hmm. close to my heart, um, and saying, listen, I've got these existing policies. What can I do with them? Um, making sure that there are different types of policies. You can get a term policy for a set period of years. Right. A whole life policy could be a term. Sometimes we call them term to 100s, but uh, permanent policies. Okay. Uh, so they, you know, they're not going to disappear after a set period of time. Um, so if, if you've got a policy like that hanging around, even if it's for a few thousand dollars, really, that, that is something that any charity could use. So I, I really think making sure that you pick up the phone and have a conversation with them and, you know, it might not be any skin off your nose well, to do it. And I think sometimes it's important for people to realize that quite often there has to be some communication with the insurance company when someone passes because Absolutely. you have to like the beneficiary really ought to know that they're a beneficiary because the insurance company doesn't necessarily go to their way to get in touch with you. There has to be some conversation, correct? Once someone has passed away? Yes, absolutely. And I think that goes into proper estate planning. Um, oftentimes people say, you know, why is it important that I have a will or why is it important that I do planning in advance? And, uh, it is important because you're leaving someone, an executor, or if you don't have a will, someone who has to, you know, sit up and do the job um, subject to a certain uh, restrictions. Um, and they have to figure out your stuff. So the more organized you are in the beginning, the better it is. And if you've got those policies sitting in a plastic bag in a bag in a box under the bed or, in, you know, under the mattress, someone better know about it. So, you know, I try to, at a, at a minimum, encourage people to get their house in order and uh, and let someone know where their stuff is. Uh, at so least that leave the a administration map. is smooth, yeah. It's a really good point because we have a lot of donors that we work with that say, yes, I'm, I, I want to and I intend to leave a gift in my will, but I, it's on the to-do list. I haven't done it yet. I, I uh, you know, I need to call someone. I need to do, I need to do something. But they just, and year after year, they're still, they still haven't done it. And so if you could sum up what is the one or, or a few most important reasons to update the will or just get the will done. Because I think a lot of people get overwhelmed and think it's going to be so much work. Well, having a will makes the state administration a lot easier. 
Uh, without a will, we have to have someone who has the greatest right to apply, and that means something to us as state planning lawyers. Um, step up and uh, apply, and you know there's court app, uh, court uh, documentation that has to be filed. And uh, so, you know, I think that uh, making sure that you have uh, the will that sets out what your wishes are, who's in charge, where you want things to go, even your personal things. I mean, really, the importance of having a will is uh, making sure that uh, someone remembers you in a good light. <laughs> Chris, I think <laughs> you have some a- statistics for you later, yeah. uh, yes. later on about how few people or how many people uh, ha- actually have a will and have this conversation. So maybe when we come back, we'll ask Carolyn, uh, Caroline to ha- give us a little bit of a f- insight on how to have that discussion about, you know, I think it's time that we sit down and talk about what happens when we leave this place, and we'll do that when we return. This is The Health Report, a production of St. Boniface Hospital Foundation. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, thehealthreport at stbhf.org, or visit us online at thehealthreport.ca. The Health Report is brought to you by our friends at Boxstall Construction. Greg Mackling, Chris Gutierrez, Caroline Kiva here. We're talking about Will Week. We're talking about leaving a legacy. May is Leave a Legacy Month. We like to get ahead of these things because that is the message today is to get ahead of your affairs, to get ahead of what is eventually going to happen to every single one of us. Difficult conversation to have sometimes to realize that you are mortal after all and that we'll all be moving on to somewhere else and getting your affairs in order. Chris, I I know that's a big part of your job is having that discussion with people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our whole team literally on a daily basis, we have those conversations with our donors because, again, so many of our donors uh, make uh, living gifts, right, through many different channels, through it's one of our special events or just send in a donation or whatever the case may be. Um, but making that last gift is important to plan for, too. And, and you know, a lot of our donors, they want to get it sorted out, but sometimes they're a little bit overwhelmed. And so, Carolyn, I want to ask... When we have a donor say, you know, and I don't, I don't know, there's so many different things that I need to consider. Like, how simple could making a will be? Does it have to be really complicated? I don't think it has to be complicated. I think uh, what is important is to know what your wishes are, who you want to benefit uh, when you pass away, and then sitting down with uh, with the right kind of lawyer who practices mm-hmm. in the area of estate planning, who could draft an appropriate will. Um, that reflects those wishes. And how how do you think, what's the best way from, from your point of view that a donor goes about um, connecting with charities and deciding which charities to give to? What's kind of the process that you work with your clients on that? So typically, as you said, it's something that's near and dear to their heart. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked about there could have been a life experience uh, to to them or a family member that really triggers for them. And then all of a sudden they say, you know what, I got really great care at the St. B. So I want to see what I can do for the, for the hospital. Um, that would be a matter of picking up the phone. It may be a matter of having a conversation with me and I can pick up the phone on their behalf if they want, either on an anonymous basis or use their name, whatever they prefer, a joint meeting or, um, me directing them to the charity itself for them to have that open conversation, you know, whatever amount of hand holding they would like, uh, to to figure out a, the best way to give a gift. That's great. And from from my point of view, from the charity's point of view, it is quite simple. We always ask the donors, um, where do you want to? What do you want to do with your gift? Do you want to uh, de- designate it to somewhere? So do you want to pick palliative care, cardiac, whatever's near and dear to your heart, or undesignated? And sometimes the reason donors pick undesignated is because they don't know when they're going to pass away and they don't know uh, what's going to be part of our hospital. I mean, there's a lot of changes happening with the WRJ right now. So, you know, when you sometimes you need to plan and say, if I give to palliative care, well, there might not be a palliative care in St. Boniface Hospital. So sometimes when you give area of greatest need, that's where really the most urgent thing that needs to happen at the time of your passing, it will go to that. So for us, those conversations are important to make sure, but that's as, that's as really as much as we need. We're just the kind of, we want to fulfill the intentions um, of the donor and make sure that when their will gets realized that it gets put to the best use. Right, and I try to make sure that I draft a document that uh, there, so that there's enough flexibility to ensure that the gift is effective. Yeah, that's great. And so what about for the donors that, you know, what are kind of the benefits of giving to a charity versus not? So if someone's saying, I don't know if I want to put a charity in my will, 
Is there any benefits for them to do that other than just feeling great and having a huge impact on I the community? I think that's a great reason. You know, I, I you know, f- I, the reason I volunteer my time is because it makes me feel good. Yeah. And I know I'm doing uh, something wonderful for the community. Um, and I can do that. So um, there are tax benefits, of course. There are credits you can get. Uh, so it depends. If, if tax is the driving uh, force for uh, gift giving, great. We'll take it. I don't sure. think anyone will say no. Any yeah. charity will say no. Um, and we'll work with uh, the clients' advisors, accountants, uh, investment advisors, insurance uh, planners, to and lawyers, of course, to ensure that uh, that we do get the most bang for their buck for, from a tax perspective. And if it's just a matter of making sure that uh, that uh, the charity is their child and that child gets the greatest uh, benefit, then we'll make sure that we draft the documents appropriately to reflect that as well. There's a word that's uh, come up several times. In fact, every single time we've had this t- discussion, it's bequest, but we'll have to wait until after sports, news, and weather before Caroline Kiva, she's a lawyer, associate counsel, Thompson Dorfman Sweatman, LLP, board member at St. Boniface Hospital Foundation, answers that question for us, amongst many others, as we continue our discussion. And Dr. Grant Pierce will join us to tell us about an incredible, an amazing world, potentially world-changing discovery and research happening at Albertson Research Centre as we make our way through another edition on this Sunday morning of the Health Report. Austin Saragusa is next with 680 CJOB Sports. Greg Macklin, Chris Gutierrez, and Caroline Kiva in studio with you today. We're celebrating Leave a Legacy Month in May. It's Will Week. You may have seen the insert in the Winnipeg Free Press earlier this week. A compilation of all the incredible foundations and organizations in Winnipeg that raise money for incredible things in our community. And Chris, I know that sometimes it's seen as there's kind of competition, but maybe there is competition for dollars and you're building value. I mean, let's be honest about it in terms of why you would want to invest and and leave a legacy with St. Boniface Hospital Foundation. But there's also an understanding that there are so many great charities, great and worthwhile causes outside of St. B. And we're not blind to that. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, I personally give to many charities. And uh, I mean, the average person, uh, average donor usually gives to about 10 different charities. And uh, especially in their will, sometimes we'll see like 20, 30 different oh charities in a will. So, um, you know, we really don't see it as competition. We see it as, um, you know, we, we like to be kind of a favorite charity of many. Sure. Um, but we we're, we're totally understand and respect and encourage people to give to multiple charities. So we understand that philanthropy is a growing thing in our society. People are talking about it more often. And one of the reasons why it's so critical started with the creation of the St. Boniface Hospital Foundation in support of the St. Boniface Hospital Research Center that really was just a great big giant building with four researchers once upon a time back in 1988 when it opened. Dr. Grant Pierce was one of those researchers. And Dr. Pierce, some incredibly exciting, if not potentially world-changing news coming out of your lab at Albertson Research Center this past week. How are you today, Dr. Pierce? Thanks for taking some time. Merry Christmas, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to join you. So tell us a little bit about the announcement from uh, Thursday and how this could change uh, your life, my life, and really anyone that has ever been and could ever be sick. Well, this is a collaboration with Dr. Pavel Dibroff at uh, the University of Manitoba, and, uh, I mean, in a nutshell, I guess, what we've done is find, uh, found a, a new antibiotic, and uh, it's kind of a completely different one, uh, will address a major problem that is looming on the horizon, and that is multidrug resistance. In fact, of course, it's not really on the horizon, but the estimate is by uh, 2030, somewhere around there, um, most of the antibiotics that we use today uh, will become ineffective, and so that if you skin your knee and uh, get it infected, it could be life-threatening in the future. So uh, the development of new antibiotics is absolutely essential. So this discovery was published in the Canadian Journal of Physiology and Pharmacology and uh, marks one of the most uh, you know, incredible findings and, and research works done at St. Boniface Hospital at Albertson Research Centre. Uh, what's the reaction been worldwide, Dr. Pierce? You must be hearing from people all over the planet on this. Um, yeah, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting quite, a bit of, uh, quite a bit of attention. <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's great for St. Boniface Hospital, and 
And uh, for all the researchers at St. B, I, I think uh, we have some fabulous research going on. And I think this will just uh, help to increase the exposure that, that we get. Not all the research, <clears throat> great research out there is done at uh, institutions like UCLA or uh, Yale or Colgate, even little old Winnipeg and uh, St. Boniface Hospital does some fabulous research. So, Dr. Pierce, maybe give us an example of if you've got pneumonia and you've got the type of pneumonia where you can take antibiotics, what happens uh, in terms of the, uh, how does the antibiotic work typically? Does it target just good bacteria, bad bacteria, or is it a blanket approach? Tell us how that works and, and how, uh, P, uh, of course it's PEG, uh, P-E-G, uh, 2S uh, targets uh, the bacteria that it's trying to eradicate. Most antibiotics will hit one of three targets. They'll either hit the bacterial cell wall and kind of punch some holes in there and, and make it so that it's not viable anymore and there, thereby killing the bacteria, or will hit the protein synthesis or DNA replication so that the bacteria can't, can't grow, can't get bigger. And of course, that's what you want as well. So traditionally, all antibiotics hit those targets. The reason why our antibiotic is uh, kind of a breakthrough is that uh, it's hitting a completely different target. And the bacteria uh, kind of have evolved over time to recognize these traditional antibiotics because they're all hitting the same targets. So it's important uh, ours is hitting a different target. It's hitting the energetics of the bacteria because we're hoping that we'll get away from the multi-drug resistance and these superbugs that are out there today. Now, our particular target is not in the normal cells of your body, and it's not in the good bacteria. It's just in a bad bacteria, a selected number of bad bacteria, but uh, that's why ours is, again, kind of... Uh, uh, interesting and, and potentially uh, very, very important because um, we don't expect that there'll be a lot of side effects, uh, whereas the traditional, uh, the, the traditional antibiotics will be uh, hitting all sorts of bacteria, uh, good bacteria as well as bad bacteria. So when you publish this paper, and we've talked about the different steps of bringing this to market and having this as a consumable for uh, the, the mass population, where are we at in that process? The pa paper has been published. What is the next step for this? Well, we're, we're continuing with protecting it uh, patent-wise, but also we're, we're continuing with the research. We're trying to understand what the structure of our drug is, what's the most, what's the best, the optimum structure. So we're, we're manipulating that as well as looking at exactly what types of bacteria this hits. And so far it doesn't hit any good bacteria that we've tested and it doesn't hit any of the good cells of your body. Uh, but it is killing, uh, so far we've had four that it's killing and those bacteria are important for diseases like uh, uh, Legionnaire's disease, pneumonia, um, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, gum disease. They're all different bacteria that cause those, but our protein, our target that, that our antibiotic hits, uh, actually uh, sh should stop those and, and does kill those bacteria. And so next would be, uh, once pat patent protection is in place, you would start animal trials, or can those two no, things happen at the same time? Yeah, we're doing that right away, so I would expect us to get into that very soon, into the animal trials, and then, then, then it goes into human trials. Uh, it will take time, but uh, we are aware that the United States, the U.K., and most countries now <clears throat> have uh, realized the danger with the superbugs and the multidrug resistance and have uh, fast-tracked. Uh, all the all the antibiotics, if you have a new antibiotic, they're going to fast track it in the regulatory aspect as well as in clinical trials. So um, I think we could expect uh, something on the near horizon. And, uh, you know, if everything works out well, then it then, uh, should, be, should be very soon. So, Dr. Pierce, before we let you go, we are talking about leaving a legacy and creating a will in which you identify a, a worthy cause to leave a legacy. Let's uh, talk about how someone who may have left a legacy uh, to St. Boniface Hospital Foundation in the past may have contributed to this discovery. 
no question, particularly on this one, which we kind of ran quietly for about five or six years, uh, that there's no question this was supported by that kind of donation. Um, because it was, uh, how shall I say, it wasn't front line in our, in our uh, research direction, so we needed to kind of do this on the side. And legacies like uh, our left uh, by, by your donors are absolutely essential because it provides the rich collaborative environment that we took advantage of in this. And Dr. Debroff and I working together uh, is a perfect example of how the donations that we receive uh, actually spur ahead the um, new research and the new directions that research uh, uh, um, needs to have if we're going to advance and move into some exciting new areas. We've heard the terminology blue sky research. Does this fall under that category? Absolutely. No so, question of that. Blue sky research is basically where you're, you know, you're, well, you put it into your words. You're the, you're the doctor. I'm certainly not. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I was always told that you use 70% of your research money for your bread and butter uh, stuff that you know is going to, uh, is going to produce results. And you use 30% of your money for that the next five years of research, that that exciting new development that you think might produce positive results, but you're not sure, so you're gambling. It's a gamble. It's an educated gamble. It's an educated guess, but this is exactly what that was. So it's kind of uh, way out there, risky research, but it certainly paid off, and uh, it's a perfect example of blue sky research where you're you're trying to do something that's... that's, uh, quite different and that's where you get your eureka and your your uh breakthroughs dr pierce uh, always an honor to have you congratulations on this we look forward to hearing much more about this as uh the months and years uh roll along here thank you very much and thank you to all the donors out there because they're actually partners in this they're the ones that have uh, created this and we're we're uh, uh, very thankful for their their donations Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Dr. Grant Pierce, the Director of Research at Albrechtson Research Center, St. Boniface Hospital. Very exciting thing happening right in our own backyard and, and Chris, really just down the hallway from you folks at the foundation. Absolutely. We're incredibly proud and our donors are inspired and honored to be a part of this. And it just it really ties into what we're talking about today. Like we're talking about leaving gifts, whether they're living gifts or gifts in your will um, that are going to benefit generations to come. And it just proves that the dollars that donors give are actually going to benefit the generations to come. This antibiotic will be in place years to come from now um, that potentially is going to save many lives and cure many people. And it's just really encouraging. I couldn't believe that this showed up. (laughs) I got the press announcement (laughs) in my inbox. I spent a lot of time with Dr. Pierce. I didn't even hear a whisper about this. So when you talk about uh, the ability to be discreet and to do things uh, the way they ought to be done, I can vote for the professional uh, conduct of the the research there as well because, uh, like I say, I spend a lot of time with Dr. Pierce outside of of, uh, work hours, so to speak, and this is the first whisper I heard about this was this announcement uh, earlier this week. Caroline, thanks for your patience on this. This announcement is obviously groundbreaking. Why don't we take a break? We'll update our listeners on weather, and then we'll come back and wrap up our discussion uh, about estate planning and leaving a legacy this morning right here on The Health Report. Greg Mackling, Chris Gutierrez, and Caroline Kiva is with us here. We're talking about leaving a legacy. And, well, I wanted to know, what, about half an hour ago, what a bequest is. So we'll find out about that. We'll also maybe get some hints on how to have that discussion with your loved ones. It's time to have a will. And, Chris, in your startling fast facts, the number of Canadians that do and don't have a will may in fact, startle some of our listeners as well. Yeah. So, I mean, currently right now, um, studies show that about 56% of Canadians don't have a will. But more importantly, Carolyn, you you were just talking about um, the fact of how many don't have an updated will, which is actually even more important. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. I, on many occasions, people say to me, oh, I have a will. 
And then I say, well, when was the last time you drafted that will and, uh, or, ta- or even taken a look at it to see if it still reflects your current situation for your family members? And they said, oh, well, it was drafted 10, 15 years ago when my children were small. Well, your life has probably changed in 10, and 15, 10 or 15 years, so it's uh, important to give your will a, a checkup. So what is a bequest? That, that sounds like a um, legal term. Yes, it is. Very legal. Very serious. Yes. Um, you know, I think what it actually means is a, a gift of personal property by will, but of course we don't think of it that way in the general public. We think of it as just a gift by will, and we don't uh, – we sort of don't def- differentiate between – our things like our handkerchiefs and our furniture um, to cash gifts. So whatever the case may be, when I sit down with a client and they tell me their wishes, it's not what I label it or correctly label it at that moment in the discussion. It just has to be written correctly in the will and make sure that the uh, the gift is you know reflective of their true intentions. So we can't get hung up on terminology. Yeah, and there's a lot of terminology, and you know, and, and talking about our fast facts is that some of the the terminology that people use when they're talking about uh, gifting uh, to a, a charity in their will is leaving a gift in your will, plan giving, uh, estate gifts, um, and on and on and on. Right? There's a lot of different terminology, but the point is, is that it's it's working with a lawyer to leave a gift in your will, no matter what you call it. It all means the same thing, no matter what type of gift it is. It's all the same. What is uh, the foundation's uh, group, the Legacy of Hope? What is that? Yeah, so we have a, a society that we uh, call it is the Legacy of Hope. And so these are people, these are individuals, our donors, who have let us know that they've left a gift in their will. And so we have over 100 of uh, those individuals right now. And of course, every year that changes because unfortunately we lose donors every year. But then um, every year more people that we meet will say, yes, I've done it. And um, so it's a great society that you get a pin when you're a part of it. You get invited to special events. And it's really just a way for us to honor and recognize our donors for making this significant pledge to the future of healthcare. Okay. So some of us are procrastinators, procrastinators by nature. This is really not the, the best way to honor your friends and your family by not taking care of your affairs ahead of time. This, this can be a real pain in the neck for those that are left behind. Let's be honest about it. It can fracture relationships. Oh, it's terrible. It can divide families, right? No, actually, absolutely. That's that's the plain and simple truth. So how do we... You know, maybe maybe your spouse is uncomfortable with the idea. Maybe they think it's unlucky to, yes, you know, you th- a lot of there's that. lots of different reasons why people don't have a will. How do you overcome some of those uh, concerns and those objections? Well, I try to make the meeting fun. So uh, there are not a lot of tears and, and crying, but we, we approach it like any business decision and sit down and, and run through it. And I try to give clients a checklist in advance so they can do some thinking on their own and not spend their time because oftentimes people are concerned about the cost of, of preparing uh, will and estate planning documents. So I want people to be as prepared as possible. And, and then the meeting is very efficient. We do it. We draft it. Sit down, sign it, and away they go, and they don't have to think about it unless a major life event occurs or they want to do what I tell them to do, which is do their checkup every couple of years, make sure it's still reflect reflective of their wishes. Um, but uh, also one of the more important things is making sure your beneficiary designations are, are also up to date. So it's not just the will itself. It's making sure that your life insurance designations, your RSP, your TFSA, um, I could go on. There's so many of them. Um, are up to date and reflective of your wishes. So, so really, anybody listening um, today to the show, which there's the many listeners that I'm sure are like, yeah, I've had it on my to do list. I need to do it. So, it's as simple as calling someone like yourself mm-hmm. and setting up a meeting, and really, you'll sort them out. You'll give them the checklist. You'll go through everything. Like, I think a lot of the feedback I get is that it's overwhelming. You know, and we talked about those technical terms, and even for me, that's like, oh, what's that? What's that? You know, some of those things, and and so, but it doesn't have to be right. Like, I mean, you'll talk in layman's terms, walk them through it, and it's it's really just getting everything sorted out. I love to draw pictures in my meetings, so I'm often drawing pictures to explain things. I'm a visual learner. I appreciate it, so I, I assume others appreciate it, um, and the key is to make sure that it is painless, and That's we're great. not doing this last minute. And so maybe the last thing I'll leave on, it doesn't 
really tie to leaving a legacy, so don't get mad at me for this, Chris, but just this idea of tying it to healthcare and living wills and creating uh, your wishes, because that's a big part of what we're doing now, and that is to establish uh, our, our wishes. And if we are ever in a situation where we're in serious care, we're in serious uh, condition after either a stroke or some tragic accident, that, that, that's a big part of the wishes that we're outlining these days? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is uh, such a focus on on actually preparing a will, but there should also be a focus on preparing a, a living will or a health care directive and also a power of attorney because we live longer. We don't necessarily live healthier. Um, and um, we, may be ha- we may become incapacitated and we have to ensure that we have the appropriate documentation um, in place and appointing the appropriate people to make decisions on our behalf. And, uh, you know, the key is to do this well. Caroline, thank you so much for this. Thank you for your work on the foundation on behalf uh, of the board and on behalf of uh, your work at Thompson Dorfman Sweatman LLP. It's so great to have you back in the city. I'm happy to be here. Thanks to thanks to don't leave us again. I'm yeah. not. <laughs> thanks to, for doing this and, and thanks for all your time. Now, we always talk about our firsts. And Chris, you've got an interesting uh, first in terms of planned giving. Uh, This phraseology doesn't really go back all that far. It really doesn't, actually. So when I talked about all the different terminology, the one that's most popular in this in this sector is called planned giving. And that's the reason for that is because it's it's you're planning out your will, you're planning out the gift. Um, and so that phrase was coined in 1972 by Robert F. Sharp. So really not that long ago. So who knows what they called it before then? Well, I got to tell you, I said it wasn't that long ago to make myself feel Feel. a whole lot better (laughs) 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 because, uh, well, I was at least born uh, when it was created. So that's good. That's a big thing. Now uh, you were going to, I'm going to quiz you. Okay. Do you have a will? I do have a will. I do have a will, but but I need to get it updated. And so um, I'll be visiting with Caroline to get it updated very soon because it has been, it's been about 10 years now. So now- Greg? Yes. Do you have a will? No. And Uh so based on our combined heights and the average of our heights, we fit the uh, Canadian average almost perfectly. 56% (laughs) don't have a will and 44% do. So you see? Yeah, I see. So how about by next Sunday you get this sorted out? That's By your, next Sunday. <laughs> that's your challenge. Oh, I have nothing I've, I've else t- to do this week. I've been telling people how simple it is, so just call Caroline and get it sorted. Well, actually, Caroline and I have a long string of emails uh, to take care of this, and it is something that's on the radar without question. Chris, thanks for this. Hope you have Thank a great you. week, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday for another edition of The Health Report. If you'd like to catch up, go to our website, thehealthreport.ca. You can send us an email from that website, and we want to send out a special thank you to our friends at Boxstall Construction who make this program possible each and every week. Matt Cardy standing by with Global News and Weather, followed by Keith McCullough, Christian O'Mell, and yours truly. It's Sports Sunday from noon till 1. Sunday from noon till 1. Sunday from noon till 1. Sunday from